Hey, happy Friday. Welcome back to another Friday Tech Workshop. I'm Joseph, a senior developer advocate with AppSmith. And this week we're gonna do something a little different. Instead of building a specific app from start to finish, I'm gonna explore a couple different options for generating those colored tags that you see in platforms like Airtable and Base Row. Uh, they're also used for labels on GitHub and Trello. Lots of different platforms use that UI pattern where you've got a list of values in a single field and you display them as those tags or sometimes they're called chips or pills. Um, but the trick is you want to have a color that goes with each value and make that repeatable. And when you only have a short list of values, that's pretty easy. You can have a lookup table or a config object and use that to find the right color that goes with each value. But if you've got an unknown set of values or just hundreds of them to manage, uh, you don't want to have to maintain that big list of lookup values and keep adding a new color for each new word. So another approach is to randomly select a color, but it's not quite random because you want it to be repeatable every time that word comes back up. And at the same time, you don't want to have to assign one explicitly every time. So there's a couple different approaches. And then when you use a platform like Base Row or uh, Airtable, the API has some options where you can look up the color that goes with each one. So you can have your own hard-coded set of values that you look up against. You can randomly assign one, or you might use a platform that provides that info and you just have to join the two. So lots of different ways to approach this. Um, but first we're gonna look at how to generate that type of element. You know, uh, take the tag name and turn that into an actual um, span with some rounded corners, or you can use a button or whatever element you wanna use. Uh, and then we'll look at how to assign the colors with those three different approaches. So first, let's get started just generating the element itself, and then we'll look at some data from the Airtable API and tie in the colors from there. All right, let's check it out. Okay, so this is what we're trying to build. When you have a list of values in a single column, and you wanna turn each one of those values into this colored tag or chip or pill, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and the colors are repeatable. So every time blog is used, it's going to be the same color and you can easily scan and see that quickly. So we're trying to replicate that functionality and there's several ways to go about adding the color. You can have a color object to look up the value. You can assign one based on the string itself and come up with something that's kind of random, but uh, repeatable for that string. And then uh, the last option is using the API to get the actual colors assigned to each one of these tags. So in Airtable, there's an option to figure out the schema for the entire table. You can, um, you can get back that schema and then figure out which field you're trying to use, get the options for that field and drill down into that data. And it's pretty nested, um, but it does return all the colors. So you can get that list of colors and then use that uh, to assign the, the color to each tag as you're creating it. Um, so we're gonna walk through each method, starting with the easiest one where we'll just hard code some colors. And uh, I'm gonna start out on a blank page of the app here. And start out, we'll drag in a text widget. And I'm gonna do an iframe as well, just to show the difference in displaying these tags. So we're going to use an iframe, um, but it doesn't need to be a big web page. Like it could just be a, a display for these tags. And then either one of these could be put inside of a list widget so that you can have that as just one column of your data. Um, so I'm going to start with the iframe. And so I could just put some plain text and that'll display without any HTML tags at all. Um, but in order to put some styling on it and have different elements here, I want a tag, so I'm gonna use a span. And you could use a button or a div or whatever, um, but I'll put some text here. All right, so it doesn't look much different than when it was just the text, but now that it's a span, I can target that with some style tags. And so I could say that I want every span to have a background. It's blue. 
and let's make that light blue. I think that's a web safe color there. There it is. Um, so it looks decent. It's got good contrast, but there's no padding at all. Um, we want to put some space around here and some borders and margins. Uh, so first we'll do padding and let's try four picks. Okay. And then I'll do a radius and you can use half of the height um, just so it makes it evenly round. We'll do a border radius of 50% of the vertical height. And then the padding, it looks good on the top and the bottom, but it could use some more on the sides. So I think if you use two values, the first one is top and bottom and the second one gets applied to the sides there. Um, so that's looking pretty decent now. It, uh, it, it looks pretty close to one of these tags. And, you know, we could keep tweaking the styling and everything, but um, actually the last thing I want to do is just put the font family in here. Just to make that look a little cleaner. Um, all right, so let's try the same code in the text widget. I'm gonna close out this style tag first and grab all this. So if we put the same code here in the text widget, you'll see that the text itself displays, but it's ignoring the style tags. Now you can still use styles in a text widget. They display HTML tags. It'll even display an image tag, um, but the style gets ignored if it's in its sep a separate tag like this. It needs to be in line. So if I grab just the styles here, I'm gonna cut that, get rid of the tags, and then we'll put this in line right here. Style equals, and then put all that inside of it. And the one thing throwing it off here is the auto height on the text widget. So if I set that to fixed, um, you'll notice it's pretty close now but the font here is bold and it is not bold on the iframe. That's because it's related to the, the same uh, reason we had to move the style inside of the tag. It's because the text widget has its own style section. And this stuff is gonna override whatever you're trying to do um, unless you use the important flag. So you can add that if you want. Uh, you can turn off the styles here that we're overriding that and getting applied. But basically you can generate these tags uh, merge in some text and add a couple styles. And then you got something that looks like a single tag inside either an iframe or a text widget. And then either one of those will work in a list widget. So next, I want to build a set of these from a string or uh, from an array of strings rather. So let's go to a JS object. Start a new file here. Just clear all this out. So I'll have a tags array. And I'm just gonna put a couple values in here real quick. Uh, we'll start out with APIs, JavaScript, and databases. All right, now I wanna map over this and return a set of those tags, just like the one that we built. Um, but be able to pass in the tag value, and then we'll look at assigning a color. So tags, let's call it array to tags. So this will take in an, an array of tags here, and let's call it array is this dot tags array. Oops. Okay, and then I'm going to map over this array and return something that looks like one of those buttons. So return array.map, and then for each one of these tags, inside of here we want to return something that looks like um, that tag button that we have out here. So I'm gonna copy this code, and just to make it work in the text widget. I'm gonna use this version. 
where there is no style tag separately. It's just inline style. And instead of the brackets here, um, we'll just use a template literal. So the one part we want to make dynamic then is this text inside of the span. So I'm going to use a template literal here and pass in the value from this tag that we're mapping. So this should give us an array of those strings that would make an HTML tag, but it's actually an array. It's not an HTML element. So at the end of this here, we just want to join it. And with join, if you don't give it a parameter, that is going to join it with a comma and a space, I believe. Um, we want to join it with, no with nothing in between, so just an empty string. And that should display inside our text widget now. So let's reference that JS object one dot array to tag function. Okay, so we have some tags being generated now. Um, let me give this some more room here. Getting a little bit of a lag because of the stream. There it is. Okay, so we're generating an array of tags. Um, we got the basic styling down. We're passing in just the array of strings and getting back all of these individual tag elements. Now, the next thing is to assign colors. So the easiest method is when you have a fixed list of tags and it's fairly short and you just want to assign a color to go with each one. So we can use a color object where there's a property for each tag and then a color that goes with it. So we'll have APIs and then that's gonna have some color here and just copy this. And then I'll put in a few colors, um, just copying some stuff from the browser here. I've got a color picker, so I can grab that orange and yellow. And I'll grab the blue from this text. Okay, so this object now, if I go to color object dot, APIs that'll return this color or dot JavaScript will return this one. So right here where I'm defining the color, uh, let me just add a line return here to make this a little more readable. Um, I'm going to make this part dynamic. So we'll put a template literal here. And then the, the way that we get the right color is passing in that tag to access the nested property of this color object. So we'll go to this dot color object. And then use the uh, square bracket notation there to pass in the T. And that should take this tag value and access the color that goes with it. So let's see how this looks in the editor now. All right, cool. So with that approach, you can dynamically generate all these tags. For each value, you've got some lookup value here in this color object, and that'll be repeatable. Um, however, it's not very maintainable. If you've got new values all the time, or you don't know the full set of values, like the user's typing in new stuff, then this isn't gonna work. Um, you could try to constantly add new values and add a new color, but the next approach is uh, where you have an array of colors and you want to pick one from that array based on the input string and always get back the same color for that string. So you might not have a fixed list of tags. They could be unknown. Uh, could be unknown amount of them or just new ones that get added. Um, but if you have a fixed list of colors, you can take that input string. We'll use some, uh, some math using the color co or the character code. And we can get the character code for each one and make a repeatable number for like a string to number function, and then use that to pick a color from the array. So next what I'm gonna do is bring in some colors 
from another page of the app here. Um, I've got a color array. And let me just put a placeholder there. And then I'm going to copy this value from another page. OK, so I'm just pasting in this array of colors. Um, lots of different ways you could generate this. I had uh, somebody on the team, one of our designers, help me pick out a set of colors that all have a similar kind of intensity and a good contrast with a, a lighter, a dark font. Um, but you really, you can do this any way you want. It might just be like four main colors that go with your theme of your app. Uh, or you could try to do like a mix across the whole spectrum here. I have uh, an array of 46 colors. And so what I want to do is take any input string, one of these tags, and convert that to a number, and then use that number to get the same color out of this array every time. So what I'm going to do is write, make a string to number function. And so this will take in a string. And I'm just going to put a default of test here. Actually, let me do, uh, we're just going to get the character code for one letter first. So return um, string. Now the string has a character code at method. This will give you the numerical character code that is uh, assigned to one part of this string using the index of it. So the, the character code at zero is going to be the numerical value, the equivalent of the S character here. And so the S is uh, as a lower, or sorry, T from test here. Um, so that's a lowercase T. If I make this uppercase and we run the same function again here, the character code at index zero now, um, it's, it's a lower value. It does the uppercase ones first. So every single letter is going to have a numerical equivalent, and we want to add all those together. OK, so to get the total for the entire string, you could add a bunch of these together. You know, It would work if you did this and then did index 1 here and index 2 and kept doing that for every character. But that's not very efficient, and it's not going to work for uh, any length of string. You would have to have something for each you know, digit or each like place. Uh, so what we want to do is build something similar that works um, for any length of string. So let's get rid of this. And first thing is to take this input string and turn it into an array so we can map over it. So I'll say return an empty array, use the spread operator, and spread that string. So this takes each character. OK, so you can see it's returning an array where each letter is a separate element in the array. So now we can map over this. And for each one of those letters, get back the character code. So for each letter, return the letter that character code. And if it's a single letter, then getting the zero index that should represent the entire string. I think there's some weird edge cases with emojis and foreign characters or whatever, but um, this should work for normal strings. So instead of using map and getting all the numbers in an array and then doing another step to total them, you can use reduce right here instead of map and, uh, and do it all in one step. So right here, I'm going to use reduce. Uh, the reduce method takes a function as the first parameter. And then the second parameter is the thing that you want to accumulate or manipulate each iteration of the uh, loop as you're going through the, the full array. So I want to start out with a 0. And every um, item in here, just keep manipulating that value and accumulating the total there. So reduce takes um, the function, the first parameter of reduce, has its own parameters, which is uh, accumulator, and then the value that you're on. So the accumulator is 0, and the first time around, its value would be 0, 
And what I want to do inside the function is set the accumulator to whatever it currently is plus the value that I'm on. And then reduce, this is um, something that I would always forget at first. With reduce, you have to return the accumulator or else it's not available on the next loop. So this should give us a total of these four. Uh, let's see, accumulator equals. Oh yeah, I'm not adding a character code yet. I'm just trying to add strings together. So I'm not getting an actual number output. Um, so for that current value, which would be the single letter, we need to use that same dot care code at index zero. That should give it something to add on each loop. Okay, so here's the total, uh, the text or the numerical equivalent of this string, taking all those character codes and adding them together. Now, this is 416 and my color array here I only have 46 of them, so I cannot go to the 416th index, but I can use the modulus. So taking the larger number divided by the smaller one here, the 46 that I have in the array, um, it's not gonna fit evenly, uh, more than likely, and there'll be some remainder. If it fits equally and the remainder zero, then I'll just get the first color. Um, otherwise, it'll be whatever that remainder is. So. This is getting a little long here. I'm going to add a line. We'll call this the uh, the index or yeah, what we're going to do is use the modulus of this number in 46 and that'll be the index. So the index that we want to get from the color array, um, it's going to be that numerical total divided by 46 and then whatever's left over, just the remainder part. Then we'll return um, this dot color array and go to that index. So no matter how much bigger that number is than the 46, uh, it's just gonna divide it by that and get that remainder. And now we're going to get back a color for this string. So, like we saw a minute ago, the lowercase value is different. If you wanted, you could turn all of your tags into lowercase before you store them. Or you could expect that they're in different cases and use the function to turn them all lowercase before you total. Um, lots of edge cases and ways to tweak all that stuff. I wanna move on to the next uh, color method now that we've got uh, this part working. So the last piece of this though, before we go into um, using the API to get the colors, the last piece is taking the string to number function and using it inside uh, right here where we were doing the color map. Uh, so this time around, we had the color object hard coded, but it had to exist in here. It had to have a lookup value. This time we can use the function string to number. Um, and this is, Let's see, the way that I wrote this, it's not doing the number, because if I only return the first line, that would be the index, the number. I am actually accessing the color. Let's call this string to color. Then I want to use that right here. And then we pass in the tag to this function. So this should give us a repeatable color for every tag, uh, but this time it's going to come from a value in this color array. So let's go back to the UI now. And you should see it is not the yellow that I picked uh, or the orange, you know, so we're getting different colors from that other array now, and it's repeatable. Every time that same string gets put in, it's going to give me back the same color, but I don't have that hassle of maintaining the color object and trying to figure out for every new string, trying to add a new value to it. So that's the second method. Uh, the last way now is using Airtable's API or base row or whatever platform you're using. And a lot of them have a method that will give you back the list of colors um, for a specific field. It's part of the schema. So it depends on what system you're using. Some platforms return the color with the data and it's just right there at the row level conveniently. With Airtable, um, it gives you back the ID and the label 
but it doesn't tell you the color it's supposed to be. So that's not at the row level, but there's a separate endpoint that's just for the schema. Instead of it repeating the color every time it comes back up, you know, it's just a different endpoint. So let's go back to the Airtable base here and let's try to replicate these colors. So using the Airtable API, um, I want to pull in the schema and the values that go with these characters. And then it's going to be a couple APIs, one to list the raw data, and that is not going to include the color. And then one to get the colors from the schema uh, and match those two up. And then we can go back to uh, programmatically generating the tags like we've been doing, but passing in the color from the API. So last piece of this, let's, um, let's start out with creating an API key or a personal access token rather. API keys have been deprecated in Airtable. Um, but if you go to the developer section here, go to personal access token and then create a new token. And from here, you can give it a name. Um, I'm working on a content calendar uh, template here. Then add scopes, and you'll at least want to get the data to read it if you're listing it, if you're trying to make a full CRUD app, get the right access as well. And then the schema, um, this base schema read. So if you want to use the API to get the schema and actually figure out what colors go with each value, then you need this uh, access, this scope right here, schema. Now, I'm not going to do right access on this one because I'm just trying to display the tags. So I'll go ahead and create this. Uh, we've got to add the base. We are using the content calendar one here. And there is an option to connect it to multiple, to all your uh, bases or a workspace. I like to just do it the bare minimum, whatever I need for this uh, one thing I'm working on. So creating the token here, I'm gonna copy this and over to AppSmith now to create a new data source. Okay, so I'm going to create a new Airtable data source. And choose personal access token. Uh, API options still there, but they're actually deprecated now. You shouldn't be able to create a new one in Airtable. So we're using the personal access token. Save that. And now we'll add a new API. So from here, you can um, add it to whatever page. I'm working on this uh, current page three here. And I want to list the records. So there's a method here, list records. And then you just need the base ID and the table ID um, or the table name. I like to use the ID because the name can change. So the ID for the base is the first one after the dot com there. And then the table name or ID. And we should get back the row level data of that table. It's not the schema yet, but we're at least getting the records. So let's put that in a table where we can see it. All right, so I'm going to connect that get records, or what was it? What I call it, list records dot data. And this comes back with a results or a records array inside of it. So you have to access that nested array of records to get it to display in the table widget. And you'll notice that uh, there's an ID and a created timestamp here, and then everything else is inside this fields object. Let's look at the data coming back from the API a little closer here. So it's an array. Here's a record and it's ID created time and then fields. Everything else is inside the fields uh, and then ID created time and then a bunch of fields. So this stuff, you might need to see the ID or created time, but uh, really you need to flatten it out and look at the fields 
first, and then you might add in the other two values. Uh, but the more important thing is to flatten it and get those fields. So to do that, then you can use JavaScript to uh, map over the first array, this outer array, and just pull out the field object. So back to our JS object here. I'm going to start a new one since this is all color stuff. And uh, just add a util function here for flattening the data. So I'm going to return that list records.data.records. And at first, I'm just going to return that data without changing anything. So we can make sure this is working and see that we're, we're drilling down to the, uh, the dot records part of the response. Now, every one of these has an ID, a created timestamp, and then all the fields. I want to get just the fields. So I'm going to return the records mapped to where each record returns the record.fields. So if we run that, now instead of it being ID created at and then fields, we're getting just the fields and then on to the next record and then just those fields. So that looks a lot more like what you'd expect to see in a table. Um, and I can connect that right here instead of looking at the raw API response. So that's in my utils, flatten data. All right, now we have a tag column here. Uh, let's go to the individual columns here and I'm just gonna move the channels to the front here so we can see the column that we're trying to work on. So here's an array of tags, and we have a function that will parse over these tags and assign a color to it and create, uh, create a, a tag for one of those. Um, but there's a couple issues. We don't know what color goes with each one. Uh, we could do that assigning from an array like I just did earlier, but it'd be better if it looked like the same colors from Airtable. So there's that issue. And then how do you display it in a table widget? So if it was, if we're using this method, a text widget or an iframe, either one of those would work in a list widget. Uh, I'm not going to show that because th that's fairly easy. The trickier part is getting it to work in a table widget. So to do that, you can, uh, there's no HTML column, but there is an image type column and that'll display an SVG. So instead of generating a span, we can generate an SVG using basically the same approach. It's still just uh, looping over the data and using a template literal. And uh, I'm not going to walk through like designing an SVG because it's the same thing that we just did, the same approach. But let me start a new JS object. And then I've got like a template for an SVG that we're going to use. So this will take a uh, array to SVG. And for this function, I want to return a template literal using the input array here. So very similar structure. And it'll have some array that it's taking in, uh, map over that, and then return a template literal. Now, I've got this set up already. Um, I worked on a temp, uh, SVG that we can use earlier. And uh, just want to show the output here, like the end of it, instead of talking about how to build an SVG. So give me just a second. I'm going to just copy and paste this in. Okay, so we're jumping ahead because I didn't want to walk through how to build an SVG and, and get sidetracked by all that. It's basically the same approach as what we did before. I'm using a template literal to pass in a couple values here. And uh, the difference with the SVG is that you got to generate each one of those little tag elements here. So I've got a rectangle and some text. But then the SVG needs to be wrapped in these SVG tags 
um, with the namespace here and some dimensions. And I'm using the length of the tags and making each one uh, 130 pixels and and uh, just coming up with the total length by how many tags there are. So a couple like random little tweaks there to, to build it and kind of assemble each component and make it look decent. Um, but at the end of that, after I join each one of the tags and create the SVG here, the last piece is to get it to display in a table widget. Um, you take that SVG and base64 encode it and then turn it into a data URL so that it can be displayed where the table widget is looking for a URL. We're going to take plain SVG markup, take those tags, base64 encode it and give it that prefix. And now it will display as an image in the table widget. So what this is doing is uh, it's actually turning this into a base64 string that'll display in the image widget, but I haven't merged in the color yet. It's, it's just hard coded to blue right now because um, that's the one thing that's, that's really new here is how do we map it to those colors from the API. So skipping past the details of building this SVG and uh, let's get back to the API to get those colors. Okay, I'm gonna call this one SVG just so I don't get them mixed up. And back to the API now, we have one to list all of the records. Uh, the thing that we're missing is the schema that gives us the colors that go with each one of those tags. So back to the API docs. Okay, um, if you check out the API reference here towards the bottom in the table model object, this took a little while to find, um, but if you go to the sidebar here to tables, table model object, and then get base schema. Um, so I can put a link for this in the, uh, in the description because it is kind of nested. It took a minute to find, but this endpoint which is uh, v0 meta bases, and then the base ID that you're on, and then tables. This has the data that'll give you those colors for each tag. So I'm going to copy this curl request, and we will paste this in to create a new API. This isn't actually going to be part of our Airtable data source um, because, let me get back here, the commands available here for our Airtable data source. It doesn't give you that method. So the schema part, that's not as common. This is just for CRUD, create, read, update, and delete records. Um, and it doesn't give you access to the schema, but the direct API will. So if we use a curl request here and make our own API, I just have to replace this token with the one from our API here. So I'll import that. And if we run this, we should get back the schema for that base. Oh, right, I got to put in the base ID. Um, so that's coming from here. Okay. So tables, we're getting back an array, actually an object first, and then uh, an array of tables here. And you'll notice that there are just two. Let's see, there's the first one. Okay, so it's coming back with two tables, which are from this base. Um, and this one has a results sheet that calculates some stuff and then just the main content pipeline one. So inside the content pipeline, there's fields, there's an array of fields, and each one of those has a name property. You can see this field, that's it. It's just those three properties. It's got a type, an ID, and a name. But then the next one, it's a single select, and it has options and choices that have a color. Uh, the one I'm looking for is a multi-select for the channels. Here it is. So there's blog, and it's the blue light two is what they call it. These aren't web safe color names. Uh, certain color names, you don't need the hex value. You can just say white, black, red, whatever it is. Um, and there's certain colors that'll work that way. 
These don't. These are coming from class names that Airtable has chosen, and we have to map those to a usable color, an actual hex string. So nested in this data here, uh, in the response dot tables, we have to find the table whose name is uh, content calendar or, or get the ID and then find the field that's got the, um, the name here for the channels, go into its options down to the choices, right? So it's, a, it's really nested, um, but that's where we're trying to access. That's the colors that we need. So let me name this while I'm here. And then back to our SVG. Okay, so I'm going to write a function that returns the color for a certain tag. And then we can just run that right here in place. I'll say, here's the tag, run the function and give me back that color. So similar to the um, string to color that we had in the, the last example, only this time the color needs to come from that API. So first I'm just going to return the get schema query dot data. And uh, we're gonna drill into that data. There's a dot tables array. And let's start with just that. Let's just return that much of it. So this is all of the tables. We wanna find the table whose name is content pipeline or since there's an emoji in there and the name can get changed, I'm going to find it by the ID. So I'm copying that and I'll use dot find. So we'll find the table that has an ID equal to that value. And you can see the first time it returned an array. So now it should return an object, which is just that table. And then inside of this table, we can go to uh, the fields array. So there's dot fields. And again, we'll need to use find to get to the specific field that has the options we want. So there's a few of them in here. There's a single select. I'm looking for that multi-select for the channels. There it is, options and it's ID. So again, I'm gonna match it by the ID instead of the name in case that gets changed. Um, since this is getting a little long, I'm gonna make this two lines. So this is the fields. And now I'll return fields.find the field. So find the field where the ID equals that new ID I just copied. This should get us pretty close. We're still not down to the options, but let's look at it. All right, so we're returning a single object that represents the field that we want, but then we have to go to dot options, dot choices. And that should be to this array. So let's look at that. Okay, this is an array where every object has an ID, a name, and the color that we want. Now, the next thing is that um, we wanna take this in a way that we can look up the color. And I don't wanna have to loop over this array every time for every single tag and then loop through the full array again. So I want to store this as an object so that the tag name can be used as a property and then we can get back uh, the color that goes with it. So I'm going to uh, loop over this array and populate an empty object where there's a key of blog and a value of blue light too and then go on to the next one. Um, so instead of this being the return here, I'll just call this choices. All right, and then I'll say const color object 
equals an empty object to start with. And then we will map over, actually, I think I'll use for each on the choices. So choices for each choice. Set the value of the color object. Um, and then go into this choice object here and use its name. So see that name. And we're going to set that to um, just color is the property name c.color and then return that color object so now we've got this object where if i go to color object dot blog i'll get back blue light too if i go to instagram i'll get back uh you know this color so it's almost there we're getting close um from here there's a couple ways you could do it I would recommend if your if your schema's not changing, you know, if you're not adding new tags, um, just get this output and save it, so that you don't have to call the schema API every time, and map over it every time to find these values and restructure it. You can just copy this as an object once you've got it one time, and uh, I'll just call this tags object. And then you can use this to get to the color. But the last piece is to get this color to, uh, to an actual web type color. These won't display if I put it inside that SVG. If I put that here, the web won't know what that's uh, supposed to equate to for a hex value. So the last piece is what I did is use the color picker and, uh, and the inspector and open this up. Like I think you go to edit the field. Yeah, and there's like 10 colors here in the free version of Airtable. If you upgrade, there's other ones. Since it was just 10 uh, for the free one, I went ahead and just figured out each color name uh, using the inspector. And I've got a color picker uh, tool here to where I could select this and get the hex. So I'm gonna share that so that you don't have to go through all that. <laughs> I've got that value here. Uh, I'm gonna copy it from my other page. Okay, so I already figured out these colors and copied them. I'll call this one error table colors. So this object will let you look up from that color name. Um, here's the actual hex value. And let's go back to our function now, string to color. If, we're, if we give this a certain string, and I'll set the default to test again, we want to return this type of color, but first it has to take that string, which needs to uh, to be in this data set, which means that I should actually use one of those here. Um, so we'll use blog. For the string blog, I want to return the right color from Airtable. Okay, so if you want, you can use the API and call it every time and get the most updated version of your schema if those colors are changing often. Or you can just store that output one time like I did here. First, you take the tag and look up the um, color name, and then you can use that name here. Or you could kind of merge these, and um, then you might have this value and like the color here. There's tons of different ways to approach it, but once you've got the data, it's just a matter of joining it somehow. Okay, so I'm gonna start over on this string to color function because this is like a one-time thing now that I've got the values. Um, I don't wanna go through this every time, so I'm just going to make my string to color function. Just look at these couple of objects here and get back the right color. So first thing then would be const color name equals and then whatever that string is use that on this dot um, tag objects and if i return just that so that'll give me back the name for the color 
But again, this is not a web safe color name that the browser is going to recognize. It's a, a class name from Airtable. So I'm getting back that color name. Now I want to use that name to get back um, the actual color from this object, which is Airtable colors. So I can use bracket notation around this color name. This dot Airtable colors and then go to that color name and that should give me the actual value. So blog should be this hex value. Now I can use this function right here to pass in the tag and get back Airtable's actual color for this field. So we'll use one last template literal here and pass in, oh, I got my dollar sign on the inside. Okay, so this is just the tag. I want to take this tag and pass it to this function here, string to color. And that should do it. I think this is going to give us back um, an array of colors for that particular set of tags. And it'll do it as a base64 image, as a SVG. So now we're ready to put this in a table widget. This is what all this has been building up to. Took me a while to figure this out. Um, this stuff's pretty easy with the tags, but then when you get into the table widget and it can't display HTML, um, this is something where I pieced together lots of different things that I had figured out over time. And, uh, and I finally got it to where I can display tags in a table widget. So you change it to an image and the computed value for every single row is going to use that SVG function, uh, array to SVG. And then the array that you're passing in comes from the current row and then whatever field that is. So this is a new column, I can't see it here. Um, I'm gonna drag this to the front. All right, there it is. So these tags now, um, they're coming from the row level, from this data. Each column is passing in its own array to the table widget, using that function and mapping over it. And the colors are the same ones that Airtable is using, pulling it from the API. So it took me a while to get this last little bit working in a table widget. I've been doing stuff like this with the iframe or text widget for a while, um, but I was just determined to figure out a way to make this look decent and similar to Airtable and uh, and not have to hard code a bunch of stuff and look up that value. So just pulling it from the API to get the real values from the schema one time and then mapping tags to it. Uh, and it looks pretty decent. You know, there's uh, there's still some work you could do on the CSS and maybe put in a max height here so that they're a little more equally sized even when there's different numbers of tags. Um, but overall, it looks pretty good. It was a, a fun little challenge trying to figure this stuff out. So I hope this has been helpful. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next week.